Bonsoir. Tout le monde? <laughs> Tout le monde. Bonsoir. I did that with Martin Walker the other day, but it was afternoon. <laughs> I had to remember bon après-midi <laughs> as opposed to bonjour. Bonjour. Bonjour covers right. everything, I think. And, you know, I've, I've just learned, pardon us while we geek in French here, that bonjourne means have a good day uh -huh. as opposed to bonjour, which is like good morning. Yeah. I never, and recently in watching a whole bunch of French television on MHC TV and Netflix and stuff, they say C. Si instead mm -hmm. of we now, a tremendous amount of time. So every once in a while, I think I'm really listening to Spanish. Spanish. I was always taught that C is the we when you're contradicting somebody. Really? Yes. But that was 250 years ago when I was in school, so. Well, Who knows yeah, it was about that long when I was a French major, <laughs> so I'll try to keep it in mind. I tried to dredge out my Stanford Russian for an event uh, with an author who'd written a Russian novel oh, wow. last week, and I could only get to Dobritain, Good day, Dobri Vecher. Good evening, Dosvi. Uh, Dosvi uh, How are you? And Yanichi Bonyapinyamayo, which means I don't understand a word you're saying, <laughs> which turned out to be the most useful of the uh, phrases. Bet. She said to me later that she was terrified I was going to make her do the whole event in Russian. Oh. But but I said to her, I, you would have lost me, you know. So there she was. Anyway, we are here to talk about Marx. First hardcover book, so yay! Whoop! Yes. As I slide it away. Congratulations! <laughs> That's so exciting. It is, and in fact, I had not seen it because normally, you know, they send uh, right. publishers send you a box of books, and I hadn't. And they arrived today. Oh. So the first time I saw my first hardcover book was in in our bag in your room. store. Yeah. Right. Well, this is the start of a series with Inspector Henri Lefort. Can we call him Henri and not Henry? I've got to do something. Yes, to, okay. Henri, definitely. And um, it is the start of a series. So we're in occupied Paris, 1940. Correct. When did the Germans actually walk, I mean, storm in and occupy the city? It wasn't a lot earlier. No, no. It, it was actually about a week before the book starts. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, and it wasn't so much storm as stroll. Yes, the Maginot Line <laughs> let them down, didn't it? Yeah, it was not uh, it was not a stout defense, which I'm actually grateful for. Well, it probably kept Ferris from being blown up. Exactly. And one of the one of the few good things that happened towards the end of the war, from the Allied perspective, is that the Nazi who was charged with blowing up Ferris as they left didn't do it. He refused, and you know I've always thought how incredibly lucky that was. Right. Yeah. Could have been any other guy, you know, yeah, would have yeah. just blown it to bits. Yeah. So now we have Paris. Now we have Paris, right. Which actually had undergone quite a transformation in the middle of the 19th century when Baron Haussmann was charged with getting rid of much of medieval Paris under Louis Napoleon and um, creating the big boulevards and the things that we know today and which are landmarks in your book, like the Café, uh, was it my, not my Le yeah, the Dumago yeah. would not would not have existed, right, right. before its opportunity. Right. What is is it on the Champs Elysees or no, what? No, it's on the uh, the Boulevard, Boulevard Saint Germain. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, you've been to Paris a lot, or you couldn't have written the Hugo Marston series. Yeah. But to go back to 1940, did you have to do some work to see what, in fact, was standing then that might not be standing now? Um, to some degree, yes. I I try to. Put stuff in the book that I'm fairly certain was around then. Um, I did a, a lot of reading as well, obviously, to catch up and, and see what, how things changed when the Germans moved in. Um, I'd always been interested in, in that period, but didn't know much about the specifics. I mean, there's right. <clears throat> little tidbits in the book that um, make sense and are really funny and kind of sad. Like, they, uh, at one point, I have the, the lampposts are wrapped in padding. And uh, they did that because they turned off all the lights, right? It had to be dark in case of bombs. Uh, but people kept walking, running, crashing into the lampposts. Yeah. So they ended up wrapping them to make them soft when people crashed into them. I love that. What did they do with the outdoor pissoir? Did they, I mean, did they wrap them? Yeah, you know, I don't know. Of, it's still actually sort of a feature of Paris, but yeah. you know, they have a whole series of outdoor outhouses in the middle of some of the nice places, generally round and made out of metal. Yeah. Only for men? Yeah. That's right. Hence, peace wire. <laughs> right. I've never um, used one, and trust well, I never I, shall. I never have. But, I mean, they were, 
kind of like the red telephone boxes, you know, but I think they're, yeah. but it just occurred to me that if lampposts were an obstacle, Peace Wire might have been worse. I will have to, I'll feature that in the next book. You could do that. That's why you come here, so I can tell <laughs> I know, right? you really cool things. Well, I brought this up because when Dan Brown wrote The Da Vinci Code, he was criticized by having used Google Maps for a lot of his research into Paris. And what, what he didn't allow for was the three-dimensional aspect so while he might have had the street right or the building right, what, what is wrong is that you couldn't see over some of the structures uh, to the other side. And so it was clear that he had not actually done on the ground research. Yeah, I'm sort of torn on that because on the one hand, you want to get the major things right. You know, you don't want to put the Eiffel Tower in Berlin or a, or a, a, a silencer on a revolver, gun stuff, right? You know, Guns are really yeah, hard, yeah. yes. But... Some of the, so for example, my first book, The Bookseller, I uh, have a scene where the main character eats a strawberry dessert in the Pyrenees in its winter. And I got an email from a reader saying, love the book, but just telling it, letting you know you can't get strawberries in the Pyrenees in winter. So I phoned my mum, who at the time lived in the Pyrenees in that very village, and I said, can you get strawberries there in the winter? And she's like, yeah, but I think it would be cheaper for you to buy them there. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so, no, no, no. I just, can you get them? And she's like, yeah, it's not 1800s. They're just more expensive. Um, right. It's like going to Costco for blueberries in January or, yeah, you know, I mean, you there's, the stuff. there's there's almost no food yeah. that you can't get. But if it's not in season and local, it's not going to be the... It's as good and... It's right. Be, yeah. But, but it had me thinking, like, so this person... She was wrong, and I pointed that out very gently. Can suspend disbelief that all of these human beings that don't exist exist, and do all these awful things to other people that aren't real, and and then about this about yeah. <laughs> and then, then like, you know, my, the, the hill I'm dying on is strawberries. Well, so I, I, I've become a lot less anxious about that. Yeah. Because um, there are going to be mistakes. Human beings writing books are going to make mistakes. And if it kills it for you, I'm really sorry, but... Strangely enough, the thing that elicits the most rage is not if you kill people, you can slaughter people, but if you kill a dog yeah. and less outrage a cat, it really, it really evokes yeah. rage in the reader. One of the first lessons I was told by more experienced writers, don't kill, kill a dog. baby, but don't kill a dog. I actually had a really good talk with Martin Walker, yeah. uh, who writes a wonderful French series with... Um, Bruno, chief of police, said in Le Perigord, and um, I, think, I think they're fabulous books, but he had a basset hound, and as the books were moving along, Gigi the basset hound was getting older, uh, and Martin had to make a decision because he was writing in real time. You know, is he going to have the dog put down? Is it going to, you know, die of old age? Or, he said, I could give it a heroic death, saving its master. And he did that, and he got away with Gigi's death because... It was heroic. Yeah, because Gigi really did, you know. Um, I can't remember all of the details, but anyway, took a bullet or whatever it was <laughs> for uh, Bruno. I can see and that then, being a risk, though. Yeah, no, he thought about it a long time. We've talked about it. We Zoomed last week and talked about it. Mm. And then he brought in a new Basset Hound, uh -huh. and the new Basset Hound has now courted and had sex with a lady basset hound, and now they're puppies. So he's kind of resolved the whole problem and just go rolling on. Made up for the death with, with, with basset mass hound. creation. Good. We will do that. Yeah. Balzac is the new basset hound. Oh, yeah, Balzac. Yeah, which I love. <laughs> anyway, let's go back to here and let's talk about Inspector, Inspector Henri Lefort. And may I say to you that I was somewhat, and don't take offense at this, well, you can if you want, but I'm going to say it <laughs> anyway. Tell me what to do. Um, I was somewhat put out by he didn't seem quite French. So I was pleased to get to the end and discover that my intuition was that he correct. wasn't quite French was actually correct. And at that point, I gave, you know, but I really had to think about it. He just doesn't sound French when he's talking in the early parts of the book, not entirely. And you're so good with Hugo and all the other people. Yeah. So 
Did Turns you, out I'm good with Henri too. You are. You really are. Yeah. But I, did you put that in deliberately as part of the fair play aspect of writing? Yeah, history? I tried to because he, it's quite a big twist about you know mm -hmm. him, and if you and if you if it's too big, then it becomes unbelievable. Yeah. And so there are there there is some of the way he talks, some of his attitudes, and some other people pick up on elements too. Uh, and I, yeah, and it's part of the fair play thing. Like, well, you're so good suppressing being British when you're writing Hugo. <laughs> I love Mark, who's British and you know practices. He's a process, federal prosecutor in Texas, and he writes a French series. I'm a criminal defense attorney now. Are you now? Yeah, you made the switch. I made the switch. We did talk about just, it. Yeah, just just a few months ago. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, I will talk later about yeah. at dinner about no. what kind of cases. We're going to be defending at the end. Wow. We have the most high profile murder case in America. Which one? It's the uh, uh, cyclist who was shot and killed in Austin. Oh, right. Uh, with Steve? Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome. I assume being a prosecutor really prepares you for being a yes, killer defense attorney yeah. as opposed to. Pun intended. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's been, it's been an interesting transition. Yeah, I'll bet. Uh, and I, after 15 years prosecuting, I suddenly realized how little I know. I mean, you know, this is so interesting because this is the opposite of um, the Lincoln lawyer. Remember when Michael had him as a defense attorney all along, and then he, as a favor to Harry Bosch, his brother, um, stepped over into the prosecutor's role. I absolutely hated it and went back to being defense attorney. I enjoyed being a prosecutor. But I got to the point where it was, I was just kind of cruising along. Yeah. I wasn't. Really be, being challenged, I wasn't. I didn't feel like I was doing good things for good people. I mean, not that they are bad people. It just wasn't. I was. I was in a rut. Um, and then I had these two friends who were uh, former prosecutors, real smart people. Um, oh, decided to form their own firm and they, they had actually, you in. They had formed it about two or three years ago. Okay. And they'd been bugging me for about a year to to join, and then finally, finally pulled the trigger and did it. And I'm super glad that I did. Wonderful. Yeah. So if we go back into Hugo Marston, how many of you remember the French widow? Okay. So there was there was a fair amount of history in the French widow, right? And there was some World War II history in the French widow. And you have talked to me for several years about this idea you had for this book. Yeah. And it was a question of figuring out, you know, finishing it up and finding a publisher for it. Yeah. Um, but I, I sort of felt now that the French widow was in part prepped for writing this story. Was that is that true? That's really interesting, actually. I hadn't thought about that. Um, the World War II does pop up uh, in the bookseller. Yep. Um, obviously, the French widow, uh, maybe to some degree in other books. I guess it's always been an interest. Wasn't the Paris librarian? What was uh, the, there was some history, a lot of history in the Paris library. Yeah, and the Crypt Thief, too, with the, yeah. Yeah, the tunnels. Um, so I guess it's always something I wanted to do and, and uh, just was always like busy with work, busy with the Hugo series. But then, you know, I didn't have any new contracts on that. So I'm like, let me finally do this thing. Um, and luckily I did it right before COVID because during COVID, like many people, I just had kind of paralysis when it came to writing. I just couldn't do it. Mm. But I had this book written and I gave it to my agent and she's like, it's really, really good, but it could be better. Do this, do some stuff to it. Um, so I was able to do the stuff to it. Great. Um, originally, it was two, two, two basically parallel timelines, like back and forth, back and forth, World uh, War One and World War Two. It's much, I think, better integrated now. I do too. And that was that was thanks to Anne. Thank you, Anne, if you're watching. Um, and and so during that bad year of COVID is when you know we we were shopping that and um, yeah, but World War Two has always been. Like Philip Kerr's books. Um, yeah. You know, we miss him. Well, my point was that you were not inexperienced in writing historical fiction, but you always had it married to contemporary yeah. fiction. So this one, however, really is yeah. historical fiction. I had a depressing realization as I was finishing Laurie King's new book, Back to the Garden, which is just amazing, which is set in the 1970s, that it, it's actually history now. It's 50 years ago. When I opened the store in 1989, World War II was 50 years ago. Oh, wow. Oh, and it goodness. was, you know, people were just beginning to write about the 1920s and the 1930s. 
I mean, where do you draw the line in historical fiction is the question. So I have to draw the line. Maybe the 50s haven't had much play because they're not really as interesting as World War II, and then we kind of leap, you know, forward into Vietnam liter war literature right. and then into the 70s. Right. The 50s don't get a lot of attention. Um, maybe yeah. because the Cold War was just so sort of paralytic and just two poles, and, you know, we were all worried about as we are again. It seems like it would be pretty fertile ground for spy stories and stuff, but not so much. Well, there are some, yeah, but, yeah. Um, but it's just kind of a... You know, it's true in English historical fiction. The one thing nobody ever wants to write about is the English Civil War and the Reformation. And having said that, Manette Walters just wrote an amazing book about the English Civil War, the only one I've ever read that I like. Huh. So they're orphan periods. Orphan periods. I like there that. are. There really are. Maybe I'll write a spy story set in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> Stick to this. <laughs> All right. So, okay. so this opens up with uh, Henri, who has desperately wanted to be part of the murder squad. It's July 5th. Oh, it's the day after Le 14 Juillet. Wow, July 15th. There you go. The day, day after, after the Bastille French day. national holiday, after Bastille Day. And he is called to the um, a townhouse where a robbery is going down. Yes. And things happen. But tell us about Princess Marie Bonaparte. Yeah, so... Great I, character, by thank the you. way. Thank you. She's I, terrific. That was, that was pretty fortuitous. So... I wanted to put real people in the book, real historical figures, and have them do interesting things and be interesting people. Um, and one thing I discovered reading about reading his, about history, and then trying to plan the book, it's really really hard in historical fiction to have strong, powerful women in positions where they can do stuff. Because you think about all the detectives were men, so all their bosses were men. Like everybody's men. Um, Unless you're Catherine the Great or yeah, uh, the yeah, first exactly. But but for yeah. this kind of book, that's not going to work. And then so I was just kind of re researching about the period, and I read about this person called Princess Marie Bonaparte, who is the great great niece of the little emperor himself, um, and ended up getting a, buying a book of her uh, biography about her. She was an incredibly strong, intelligent woman, um, not a great childhood, but came from loads of money. Uh, wanted to do her, always wanted to do her own thing. She was married, but they didn't, they didn't really get along. Yeah, yeah, and she never, never had any kids. Um, but she was really into psychology, and she ended up being a friend of um, Einstein's, not Einstein, no, uh, Freud. Freud, Freud. Uh, different hairstyle. <laughs> um, and actually, she was the one who helped him escape from Austria, uh, from the Nazis. Uh, but she lived in Paris, and I just, she just seemed like a really compelling, strong woman for that time, she did have some privilege, right? She had the money. Um, but I just thought, wow, what a great character. And so I just started to put her in the book and then she just kept... Taking over. Yeah, put, yeah, popping back up. And like when, you know, I had the, the, the robbery at the house, and at her house, and that's where she meets Henri. And then when my agent's like, oh, you need to, you know, tease out the, the backstory in a different way. I'm like, psychoanalyst, perfect. And so she, she sits down with Henri. He doesn't want to do it, but she gives him very expensive wine, which is hard to get in 1940. Oh, it's Petrus. <coughs> my heart broke. Mm -hmm. I've only drunk Chateau Petrus like once in my life. I know, I know. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, right, so you would sit down for psychoanalysis if someone gave you a glass of that. Um, and, and so his story sort of unfolds through, through her, and, and she's a no-nonsense. And, and she's big and sad, just turned into second book at I guess just six months ago um, and uh, I'm supposed to be editing it I've got till the end of the month um, oh that's a piece of cake yeah an experienced whatever. lawyer yeah. like exactly. you no problem but she's a major she's again she's a major character in the second book oh, and good. as far as I can tell will continue to be through through the so series even though she's kind of a almost like a visible hostage kind of person for the Germans they left her alone to live in her beautiful townhouse yeah wow I worried about her, you know, because I thought she for was now, be an absolute target. For now. For now. We'll see. That's right. You know, we've got a long way to go <laughs> to 1945. Long way to go. Yeah. Very true. You're giving me more ideas. Mm -hmm. she, she, I mean, she really is a wonderful person, and uh, you're right. It's a, it's a great narrative device. But what she lives in is a house that's filled with beautiful antiques and beautiful art. So there's a burglary going on. Yes. And the question would be then, is it a random burglary or 
somebody have inside knowledge or why are these things being stolen? And and then it's in the first chapter, so we can certainly say. <clears throat> well, uh, the one of the burglars. One of the burglars um, kills somebody. Is that what you're getting at? Mm. Yeah, kills a, a detective. Oh, well, we have to have a murder, or yeah. you know, come on. <laughs> Although, yeah, I mean that's sort of the catalyst to the story, um, and and Henri basically kills the the burglar and, and saves her. So she's kind of indebted to him. Well, Henri has arrived as part of the robbery team, and his goal is to be, you know, in the murder squad. And if it weren't for this sequence of yeah. events, he would not then be promoted because one of the two murder squad guys is killed by the robber. So that leaves a vacancy. It creates a vacancy, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> well, not intentionally, right. but I mean, you did have to have some way to move him yeah. because promotion into the, I mean, we know this from reading about the LAPD, right? Robbery homicide at the LAPD is like the elite unit. Yeah. And you're setting that up to be the case in Paris. So Henri has to have a, a reason to jump from the robbery squad right. to the murder squad and investigate this case, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, one of the interesting questions about wartime occupied cities, there's a wonderful book called Blackout set in London is, um, Who's doing the policing? If all the men are off fighting, it happened in Detroit too. I think um, either Lauren Estelman or Elmar Leonard wrote a really terrific mm. book about the same problem in Detroit. Who's left to be the fire, you know, who are the fire guys? Who are the serving policemen if everybody's off in the army? Yeah. And how does the civilian population treat those guys who in some cases, especially in your home country, were often treated with somewhat disdain as though they were too cowardly to go right. fight. Right, yeah. Well, and, and in, in the Paris situation is even more interesting than, than that because not only were the soldiers off fighting, but there was a mass exodus of the city. Right. As the Germans were moving in, like, how many hundreds of thousands of people headed south? Well, and, they wanted to cross over into Vichy first. Yeah, right? yeah, they wanted to get to get out of get out of the way. And, um, and so that's, police also left. I mean, it, yeah. So there aren't a lot of people left to, to run the infrastructure right. of the city. Right. And even even though a lot of people came back, I think there was a lot of suspicion against those people who had left. Like, oh, OK, now it's safe. You're coming back. You know, why should we trust you? Um, and so that you could imagine that would extend even more to the police. A policeman who flees for, to save his own life and then sort of slinks back once it's you know, safe. this is so Josh Hawley. Think about it, you know, any of you watch the video, you know, oh, yeah. of after he was out there pumping his fist and urging me out. There's a hilarious video of him running, just sprinting um, away from all of them into the safety of, you know, the Secret Service. Yeah, and, that's I classic. Mean, no kidding, it really is. But I, you're right, you have to, you have to be suspicious. Um, but they left Paris in, well, the Jews left Paris for obvious reasons. Right. But some of the people who left Paris were afraid there'd be fighting in Paris. And then when the city is occupied but not destroyed and there's not, like, street combat and all, right. some of them came back. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just normal citizens. Their families would pack up. They were afraid of, yeah, that there would be fighting, there would be bombing. And so they just headed south. And, um, you know, I read stories of, of literally there was, and I think I may put it in the book, where... This family drove south, and the, one of the elderly members died, um, and they didn't know what to do, so they put her on the roof of the car and covered her with a mattress. Um, and then I think got into a car accident, and then body for, I mean, it's kind of comic, but also kind they of didn't sad. have any ice. Right, yeah, I what know. are you going to do? What do you do with Granny when she <clears throat> dies on this trek to the, towards the Pyrenees? I mean, it, yeah, it's, it was terrible. But then, But then, yeah, once it was clear that there wasn't going to be fighting. A lot of these people came back. Um, and, and I think a lot of people who had stayed kind of resented that. Uh, OK, so let's switch from Princess Marie's townhouse filled with art treasures, not all of which are stolen, to the Louvre. Because in point of fact, while this is a murder mystery, it's actually really an art mystery. And you know, I couldn't help but think about Daniel Silva's new book, Portrait of an Unknown Woman, when I'm reading this, because uh, uh, there are Elements in common. I haven't read that. Well, you should. Okay. You'll like it a lot. But he went from spying. He retired Gabriel okay. from 
the head of the Israeli, and moved him back to Venice to be an art restorer. And then he has to delve into art, art fraud, art, whatever it all is. Okay. So one, I think that people who might not care anything about occupied Paris and all the rest of it, many people will be really interested in the Louvre, its attempt to save its treasures, the role of Pablo Picasso. Is that real, by the way? Well, or you just kind of maybe exaggerate, sort of made it up, right? Yeah, yeah but sense. I mean, so you have a chance to be um, because there were artists um, and other creative people who stayed in Paris too, um, or stayed actually more of them stayed down on the Riviera, isn't that where Chagall and all those guys yeah, hung yeah. out? Yeah, and Picasso was down there too. He was. He uh, went uh, all around, but he was Spanish, so even if he was in Paris. Right. He wasn't actually French, and Spain was a neutral country, and that might have given him a little extra play. Yeah, yeah, and you know, honestly, that's one of the things where if someone wants to dig in deep into history, they can send me an email about Picasso wasn't there on that day or whatever. Um, but uh, I don't, I'm I not going to worry about that. No, um, just ignore that. Yeah, exactly. But the, but the art stuff. What was interesting to me in doing the the reading was, and I don't know why I, this hadn't occurred to me. Uh, maybe because I just never thought about it. But just the blatant theft. Just, you didn't see the Monument Men? Just, no. Oh, come on, Mark. No. I, it was... Have you watched The Monument Men? It's an entire movie with George Clooney about the, when, when the city, the, the American attempt to retrieve as oh, much really? as possible of all the stolen art from the Nazis as the Russians are moving right towards them and trying to get away from them. But, I mean, it's, it's a very well-known Okay. Um, and, you know, the recovery is still going on. If you read um, the Klimt, you know, the um, Woman in Gold, the movie with Helen Mirren, which is absolutely terrific about the family still trying, you know, and eventually succeeded in regaining title to yeah. the Klimt, which is now hanging um, thanks to the Helena Rubenstein fortune guy whose name is I'm blanking on. It's now hanging up on Fifth Avenue. Um, is it the Cooper? Not the Cooper. Thank you, the new gallery, NEUE, right, where I've been to see it many times. But some Klimt's are also um, in Vienna. And um, there's a, yep, at the, thank you, because okay. my mind is just not in for names. I appreciate that. At the Belvedere. So we went to visit the Klimt's in the Belvedere and then went to, I've been to the new gallery two or three times to admire the Klimt's. But The Woman in Gold, which okay. was the subject of all of this, a great book and a really great movie. Recently, yeah. His father had been the guy that, you know, the Nazi that had acquired it all. And but the that's son. the thing. Everybody was just helping themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Or, we'll never really know how many. I mean, you know, if forever you heard about the Russians heisting all these Impressionists and taking them off and hiding them, you know, in the basement of the Hermitage. Well, my husband and I, a few years ago, went to St. Louis obviously before the recent developments, went to St. Petersburg <laughs> for a week as a friend of the Hermitage. It was an organized group. I think there were 10 or 12 of us. Anyway, they had put the Impressionists out. And I'm here to tell you, it was a really crappy bunch of Impressionist paintings. I mean, it wasn't anything wonderful. They got some, but they certainly didn't get the cream. But uh, uh, a lot, of, a lot of people doing the stealing weren't art experts, right? They were no. just, this is here, I'm gonna take it. Right, and you know, I mean, Goering and the salt mines, and all. and it's interesting the strategies. For example, the British National Gallery sent its art treasures to the to Wales, mm -hmm. to the mines in Wales, and distributed some of it in country houses, but most of it went to Wales. Yeah. And the theory that you know it would be safe there. <laughs> no one cares about Wales, so <laughs> it's too far from London. Sorry, then you know, it, it might be a hundred miles to you know. Whatever. Yeah. Um, you Brits think in different geographical terms that's than, true. That's than true. we yeah. do. Yeah, it's right. Way for that. Um, but in All the Light You Cannot See, which was, you know, that monster bestseller, um, it was about the Louvre and it relocating a lot of what it had to Saint Malo okay. and yeah. what went on there. So those big museums were thinking very, very strongly about how to hide their treasures. And of course, the Louvre had that whole disaster with the Mona Lisa. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, what's his name? Jonathan San, um, Sandlofer, um, a friend I've known for years, an artist in New York, wrote a, best, a big book last year 
about with the idea that even though they've recovered, they think the Mona Lisa from under the bed of the guy that worked in the Louvre that mm. I said, it's not 100% a hundred percent sure <laughs> that it's that it's not you know not a fake, which is really what Daniel Silvatore Gracie is writing about. Is there are probably paintings and other art in museums all over the world that may not be authentic, but it's just going to be too hard to work all of right. it out. But the Nazis upped all of that to some phenomenal extent. Yep. And in fact, the monument men in the very last scene, one of them, I think I have this right, goes to get a known Nazi in his own home in some like rural part of Germany, right? And on the wall, just like, you know, anybody would have the watercolor painted by his wife for two of wow. these amazing, amazing paintings. So they're they're gonna keep turning up. They really will. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so Henri is very caught up because one of the guys, the guy that's murdered, doesn't he, or a guy that's murdered, actually works at the Louvre. Yeah, he was one of the guys who was uh, security or whatever. At the he, Louvre? No, he was he was one of the ones sort of sorting out which stuff oh. which Germans oh, are taking and right, which stuff right. they're not. Um, and lying his head off as he did it. Yes, yes, he yes, helping himself here and there, which is how I gather it happened. Um, and obviously, you know, you're a you're a German in uniform in the Louvre, stealing for the Germans, stealing for yourself. Right. There's a lot of people who want to kill you, or a lot of potential suspects. Um, and you know that was the flaw in the Nazi scheme was that you know they just sort of assumed with rigid discipline that anything that was stolen from the Louvre would go to Ermann Goering's collection. Yeah. Or Hitler's and the salt mine or something, but they forgot to realize that people could just. People were just skimming, they, skimming sure. bits. Yeah, as they went yeah. along. And I wonder if all the crap ended up at Goering's place. I don't know. I mean, people. Well, probably not, because people didn't know what they were stealing. Um, but yeah, it's it was it was a war, but it was a grift and graft. It was a grift. Yeah, it was it was crazy. Yeah. Well, if you read about the Vietnam War, you learn that that's where you know the serious dope trade started. Yeah. You know, so war is an opportunity for grift, as you say, the money yeah. in. Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, unbelievable amounts of money that just went missing. And people paying attention to other things. Um, yeah, I mean, most Parisians were not, oh, let's go to the Louvre and look at the nice, they were trying to find bread or... Were they even allowed in? No, Wasn't that the period Louvre they were closed? not. Yeah, that's, I have it in the period where that it was closed. That's what I thought. Yeah, they, they opened it up later. Why? To sort of raise morale among the French citizens? Yeah, the, the same reason they opened up the theatres and the cinemas. But obviously very carefully controlled what could be viewed. Um, and and the, second, the second in the series opens with Henri going to the theater, to the movie theater, to just get a break and see something. And it, of course, the first thing he sees is this German propaganda film that starts and he sets him off. And, um, but yeah, that's, that's um, I'm, I'm trying to inch forward. I'm aware that the Second World War only lasted a certain amount of time. You know, here's the great thing about writing historical fiction. It's already aged. So you could start your second book the day after this book ends and keep going that yeah. way. We've had, I've had a lot of conversations with authors yeah. about that. Historical fiction doesn't need to be written in real time because it isn't. And if you've got a, a relatively short target, like <laughs> the 30s before the war, yeah. which is Jackie wins. Well, no, Jackie moved on it, but Reese Bowen and I were talking about that. Lady Georgie, she doesn't think will play well during the war. So she's going to inch her way, you know, towards the war. Right. Right. And there are people who write like Edwardian series, but you know 1914 is just ticking out there. Yeah. And if you advance too quickly towards it, you're, you're, everything you were writing about will right. go up in smoke. Yeah, so this is, this is July, and the new book is December. So it's just a few months, and then I might have to slow it down a bit. Just in case, I don't want to run out of a Second World War. You could just move to January, right? No, I mean, seriously, yeah, no, I, 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 I think that readers are perfectly happy. Lindsay Davis, when she started the Falco Roman series, her second book started the morning after the first book ended. Why not? Yeah. You know, I mean, Philip Coe bounced around all over the place. Well, yeah, uh, his, his solution to that was, was to ignore, you yeah, know, timelines. Yeah. And there were, and there were websites devoted to inconsistencies because of that. He didn't care. No. Um, and, and that's, you know, there's no reason why, if this series continues, it can't go beyond the war. Well, you can. Back to pre-war. Sure. Well, Philip was dealing to some degree with what we're just talking about, which is how can you be a good policeman 
you know, in, in wartime yeah. situations. And what are the what are the ethics? What are the practicalities? How much can Bernie actually function yeah. Yeah. as a cop? My actually in many ways my favorite was the one he said on the Riviera in nineteen fifty six with Somerset Mom, remember? Yeah. It was all about bridge, which which you know, I happen to be a tournament bridge player. Um so I, I used to be anyway. Yeah. Um, at a very high level. So I really enjoyed the bridge. I critiqued his bridge hands. <laughs> I'm sure you enjoyed that. I did. <laughs> but, you know, but I liked it because the war was, was all over and this was Bernie in yeah. the aftermath. And the other person who wrote a brilliant book about that is Joseph Cannon in Istanbul Passage because he has people, you know, on the job in Istanbul and then the war stops. And what are they to do? You know, they no longer have the yeah. mission. Um, what kind of lives are they going to pick up? What in their previous lives has been destroyed? Where do they want to be? You know, I mean, there was a huge amount of, of confusion and people moving about and all in the years after the war because people either were repatriating or decided not to repatriate and yeah. who was paying them for whatever they were doing and what kind of work were they going to do and who took their job while they were gone and, you know, just goes on and I think on. That's the thing about those wars. That's why I was able to slip it into some of my contemporary books. It's just yeah. the, the ripple effects just... Displacement is just, horrendous. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. And, you know, one of the things I was thinking about that occurred to me kind of nonstop as a theme of writing Henri as, as a policeman is um, there's this death and mayhem all over the world, people dying, step out of the trench, get a bullet in the head, that's you gone forever, uh, family destroyed. Somebody gets murdered in Paris, who cares? Like, why, does, why, why do we care? Like one person, thousands are dying all over the country, all over Europe. Like, why doesn't he just put down his pencil and be like, oh, it's just one more. Um, and that, again, that's something having not written historical fiction, especially in that period, is that's a philosoph philosophical question. I had not it's really an ethical question. Well, yeah. As well. Yeah, as Big well. Very much question. so. And, yeah. and What's the point of being a policeman <clears throat> if you're not going to enforce, if you're not going to respect the rule of law and yeah. enforce it? Yeah. Which is, which is kind of the side he takes, which is, look, I'm, I'm just one person. This is my job. Mm -hmm. What use am I if I'm not doing my job? You may think it's you may think human life is worth less now, but this is still my job, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it well. Well, you have to decide, you know, human life in the particular in an individual is a different choice than, you know, a whole battalion of people. I mean, you know, there, there are lots of conversations about thrillers don't really work if you can't take some massive event and, and bring it down to a personal story because it's right. just too hard to... Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, a huge body count in a book is, and right. then it becomes like, yeah, somebody else is dead. It becomes statistics yeah. rather than humans. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, in a mystery, there's also the, the element of uh, uh, the challenge, the solving of it, right? I mean, it, it's, uh, it's almost like he's been personally challenged. And he has been personally challenged, actually, in this book, because he's given a period of time to solve it, or his neck is on the line. And so I guess that's that's external motivation, hmm. um, but he has the internal too, which is to be like, you know, he's he's given a list of suspects by the Germans, um, and he's like, well, I'll look at these, but that's not all I'm going to do. So there's a, an internal force propelling him to do his job the way he he thinks it should be done. So we've talked about Henri, and we've talked about Princess Marie. Are there any other characters that you really like, enjoyed writing, and are carrying forward? Yes, yes. Um, the, we'll call her roommate, Nicola, uh, somebody who, who houses, lives in the same apartment as Henri. There's more to it than that, obviously. Um, uh, is, and, and this is, on a personal level, this is amusing to me because um, I have three children, um, twins and a younger daughter. Uh, my son and my younger daughter butt heads constantly. Constantly, they're that age, and his name is Henry, and her name is Nicola, <laughs> and so I have them living in an apartment together in Paris, where they have to get along. So I find that highly amusing. Um, oh, sounds like wish fulfillment. But, yeah, yeah, I think it's one of those things. When they're older, they'll be very good friends. Yeah. Your kids know this. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, we absolutely torture them with it whenever I can. Um, but she, she's sort of the other strong woman in his life yeah. who doesn't put up with his nonsense, um, who, who hides his secret with him, shares them, but also pushes him to get over them. Uh, she's, she's really the biggest ally for, for uh, Princess Marie Bonaparte, who's known as Mimi. Um, and I like her. She's going to stay. Um, and Is there someone down at the cop shop? There is. There is a character who you may not... Well, you probably will notice him because the, uh, for the same reason that Henri noticed him, and that is he was doing his job guarding... But he was reading a book. And for readers, I think they'd be like, oh, I think I might like this character. Uh, and that was the same response that Henri had. And um, he becomes a much more significant character in the next, in the second book. Um, yeah. Well, it's wonderful. When you write a series, you, you sort of pick up new characters and then readers like them or you like them and they kind of stick around. I wanted, you know? to, I wanted a love interest for, um, for Nicola. And I thought, the fictional one, in case you're watching, darling. <laughs> um, too young. Uh, so, so I thought, I like that guy. Mm -hmm. um, let's bring him back. And so, well, Hugo you know, has an ongoing and interesting relationship, so it's kind of yeah. what you're used to writing. Yeah, yeah. And I... Oddly, I haven't thought of one for Henri so much. I think, I think in that book, because he's so secretive uh, and, and they, you can't really have that big of a secret and a very serious relationship, I don't think. Mm, good point. Um, All uh, founded on lies, uh, yeah. otherwise, yeah. Yeah, either you lie forever or you tell, and he's not prepared to do either one. Um, he, does, he does come across somebody in the second book who... Again, doing research for this stuff is incredible. You, you find these stories of real people. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the book, um, A Woman of No Importance. Yeah. Uh, have you guys heard of that? So this uh, Virginia, Virginia Hall, she was an American. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, personality-wise, a lot like Mimi, I think. Very strong, very independent, uh, from money. She kept trying to join the, the civil service in America because she was a woman. She, they wouldn't let her. They kept like stringing her along. Um, and she ended up, well, first thing she did, she went hunting and shot her own foot off. And so she ended up with like a wooden leg from here down um, and then ended up being one of the chief spies in France where the Germans like had desperate to, to catch her. And in fact, at the one point they were closing in on her she had to escape on foot, singular, obviously, across the Pyrenees, walking. Uh, she eventually got to England and then I think parachuted back into, yeah. or came by boat, whichever it was, back to do, to spy for the English. How have I lived this many years and never heard of this incredible human being? Um, and so when I read that book, I'm like, she is making an appearance. Excellent. You know that there's a new biography about Josephine Baker, who's American. Yeah, I just heard um, about that. Wonderful, yeah. you know, black performer because the French welcomed them when Americans didn't. Um, and, you know, uh, a case made that she was a very active spy. Yeah. During the war, she lived um, on the River Vézère. She has a chateau, which I've been to see. And Martin, Walk, you know, has written about her because yeah. that's where his books take place. But, you know, they're... There are endless stories that keep emerging about the war, and right now there's a huge premium on story women's stories, yeah. not military fiction like Alistair MacLean and the Guns of Navarone or something, but stories where women yeah. um, did perhaps less immediately bravado sorts of things, but you know, kept things going. You know, <laughs> ran libraries, did undercover work, did all yeah, kinds the, the of Paris amazing stuff. Yeah, the Paris Library by. Yeah. Um... Janice, Janet, yeah, Janet, yeah. Kieslin Charles, yeah. right, did a wonderful conversation yeah. with her last year. And, and the part I love is that both Janice and the, and the character in that book end up in Montana. You know, I mean, you know, the nexus between Paris and Montana <laughs> hadn't really it's occurred not, to me. Not obvious. No, not a bit <laughs> obvious. So amazing. Mark uh, Sullivan has written two astonishing books about 
men who were, uh, one starts in the Ukraine, and the other one is about the um, Italian from Milan who helped Germans, okay. I mean, Jews escape yeah. across the Dolomites well, into I mean, Switzerland. Think about everybody in Europe was touched by that war, and millions in America. That's how many stories there are. Yeah. Some of them are mundane and not interesting. He wasn't really, I mean, Kristen Hanna really kind of got it going with the Nightingale, I think. But now, you know, you're just deluge every month. In fact, it's getting to the point where I, I'm not really diving into them because I've read so many of them. I sort of, you know, feel like I need a break. Yeah. Um, but there's an overwhelming subgenre now of World War II women's stories. Just huge. Did this happen with World War I? No, no, you know, World War I is like the most depressing war to write about. Ken Follett had it totally right. Uh, when I met him in New York, um, and he, he gave a talk to the thriller writers, and he said that the reason there's so many books about World War II is the only war in history where there was clearly a right and a wrong side. It was, you know, there was really no question about who was right and who was wrong. Um, and, you know, yeah. um, even the losers have acknowledged it, yeah, to, you know, today. Yeah. And so it makes it easier. But World War One is all shades of gray and incompetence. It's a war that should never have happened. And it should have been negotiated out, you know, yeah, very even, soon. Even the good guys were just terrible people. And the generalship was yeah. awful. And, you know, Churchill was blamed for the Dardanelles crisis. And, it, you know, it, it was actually his idea was a great one. But the execution of it, yeah. the general in charge was an idiot um and so all those generals were idiots I mean, mostly they were not yeah. trained in the kind well but they were also not trained for the kind of warfare that you know it was too rapid a transition to 20th century warfare they fought the old for people who were trained way, yeah. in the 19th century i mean what's his name you know from our um i can't even pershing you know took cavalry to world war one you know riding horses into the face of cannons but they just, you know, didn't, and you don't get to be a general at 20, very rarely. So, you know, mostly they were old school guys. Right. And right. the solution was, uh, oh, the yeah. horses are being shot. More horses. Exactly. PK, are you lurking back there with questions from the audience? I do. I've got a question all the way from Italy, Stefania. It's Stefania. It's, it's our good friend, Stefania. Um, she wants to know if... Uh, uh, Mark thinks uh, World War II could be a way, writing about World War II could still be a way to remind people about something that we have, we shouldn't forget or forgive. Are you looking to teach younger people about that terrible period? Um, teach is, is a difficult word. Um, How about illustrate? Yeah, I think illustrate. And I think, I think not necessarily in a, in a, these are the good guys, these are, these are the bad guys way but more in a way of these are, the, these are the things people had to do to survive. This is what life was like. Um, I mean, my kids could not imagine the, the starvation, the privations that the people had to go through just to get a loaf of bread or a meal. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I think that's a great question because I think it is a really good way for, for younger people uh, and, you know, even people of my generation who, who didn't live through it and it's... it's memory brought through grandparents, I suppose. Well, Stefania just... is in Italy, who stays up to absurd late hours, Stefania, <laughs> yeah. to watch these programs live. Well, Jeez. Thank you, though. Well but, done. Um, yeah, thank you. But I, I feel sure that there's a personal context, you know, for that kind of a question that we wouldn't have, because, yeah. you know, there, there she is. Thank you very much, Stefania. Yeah. We really appreciate you always have absolutely wonderful questions. She, Anybody else? She actually also wanted to know if there were any topics too delicate or dangerous to write about. Uh, killing dogs. Oh, we mentioned one. it. Does she mean in the context of the war? I think in general, yeah. I think I think in general the war, but also uh, in your own writing outside of your historical fiction, like within your bookseller series and etc. No, I, I don't think there are any subjects uh, that that I wouldn't write about. Um, I think you have to be careful within a series to stay within certain expectations. Um, you know, my, my Hugo Marston series is very traditional. Um, you wouldn't expect massive uh, gore or anything too horrific in it um, compared to the, the two books featuring Dominic, who is a horrible, horrible human being. Um, and it's, so you can't, there's nothing, generally speaking, you can't write about, but you just have to be careful not to mix 
specific genres or or well, tableaus. You want, you want to meet your readers' expectations once you create them. Yeah, yeah, and wasn't that think, well put? That was very well put. Thank you. Just ask her the questions from now on. <laughs> So in your uh, personal life, Linda from um, Linda Schmazel would like to know what's more difficult, being a prosecutor or a defense attorney? Well, she's mm. right there from the beginning. Thank wow, you, Linda, more paying difficult. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have a criminal defense attorney in the audience, um, former one, retired sensibly. Um, I don't, I don't know. It's just very different. It's two sides of the same coin, but it's it's a different skill set. Um, it really is opposite. I don't think one's harder than the other. I think each one has, I like, I like as a defense attorney, I'm starting to enjoy the fact that I can ignore some rules. Well, it's a, it's a little freer flowing. It's and, much, yeah, it's and great. as a person who actually <laughs> learned the law by reading it back in the state of Virginia, uh, what I learned from that, because I got to sit in on you know, I did all this public defender work because there wasn't any money in it. And right. I was allowed to work with lawyers and try and work on cases because, you know, I was A, free and B, studying. But what I really learned from it is he who tells the best story wins in court. Well, yes, I it's think that's true. It's harder today I think that's than true. it was I... with forensic evidence is more compelling. But nonetheless, it's amazing how you can get juries to actually overlook facts and go for you know, part of that story. Yeah, part of that is muddling up. So I had my first ever jury trial a couple of weeks ago as a, as a criminal defense attorney in rural uh, Texas, small town. Um, and I really enjoyed the ability to uh, object and muddle up the prosecution story with no consequences. There are no real rules for defense attorneys. You can be obnoxious. I wasn't, but you could be. Uh, whereas a prosecutor has to follow these certain steps. They have to be good and they have to toe the line because if they screw up the case, then they get in trouble and they lose their jobs. Whereas what or we're trying to do... Or they also subject to appeal if they really exactly, screwed up the exactly, case. Exactly, yeah, right? and that's terrible. That's yeah. If if I do something that's beyond the boundaries and I get a not guilty, there's no appeal from that. I win still. Um, so th there's a... The word cheating comes to mind. It's not that. I wouldn't lie. I wouldn't be just you have a You have a freer range. Yeah, much freer range, which is, which is nice. Um, and I also really like helping people. When somebody, somebody phones us needing representation, very often it's for the first time. They're terrified. They're, they're, all they can see in their future is prison. And by the end of the phone call, I've basically told them it's going to be okay. Hmm. Did you read the story today in the Republic about the photographer who, um, it's a fascinating story. He got arrested for um, climbing up on top of something to take a shot. Anyway, he was pursued by jurisdictions all around the United States, but, and he was so broke, he couldn't do anything about it. He couldn't raise bail. It was just horrible. Oh, wow. But his photographs began to be, what are they called, NTFs? Isn't that yeah. what they are? Okay. Oh, really? So his photographs gradually got entered into NTFs, and by the time he was a year into this saga, he's become a millionaire. And he has now devoted uh, money to working on bail reform. Yeah. There's an organization and so forth for people who, um, some of them are so poor, they have to choose between making bail and hiring an attorney. And so they just get lost in the system. You know, it's really hard for them. Yeah, that's getting... In my jurisdiction, anyway, that's getting a lot better. People are recognizing that people are being held in jail purely because they're poor. Whereas, right. whereas somebody in the exact same position who has a couple thousand dollars, 10,000, whatever it is, can get out. So I that's love it. Here's the title for a book. You know, get arrested, get poor, get rich, get even. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Which I thought yeah. was, you know, a great article. Yeah. No. Anybody here have questions that they would like to ask? No, you're all mesmerized by all this, right? That is a question I do get asked quite often. Um, Especially by me. Yes. Because I like you. We'll talk. Yes, I like Hugo too. Um, but it's hard for Mark to have a full-time job and write and write these books yeah. and also make room for Hugo. My, my partner's told me that I'd be working less than I would do at the DA's office. That turned out to be a lie. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that said, he's certainly, I've certainly not, I'm certainly not, 
closing oh the door. I'm not closing that door at all. If this series done well, one strategy is when he signs a new contract to insist that one of the books be a Hugo. I know how to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I paid a lot of attention to contract law. <laughs> My other agent did. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, well, you know what? If you don't mind buying what two, three hundred thousand copies of this, I won't have to. Right. He's okay. I, <laughs> I was so good at my job that I retired at 50, and this is a not for profit bookstore. So, you know. Well, we're hoping you don't make a profit. Um, no, I want to make a profit for the staff. I don't get paid, is what a not for profit. The owner does not get paid. So, all of the money in this bookstore goes for the staff. Yeah. You know, but I was fortunate. So, there we are. Isn't that right, PK? Your principal salary is all because I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Right. 100%. I and you know, what's a really nice thing is that John was not paying attention because we have a donation button. Um, and he'd forgotten to notice that he was getting these various PayPal donations. And finally, some woman who very kindly sent us a very large check wrote to say that she thought the least we could have done was thank her. Yeah. And so I went, oh my God. Uh, so I, you know, I go, no, seriously. So I spent like two and a half hours this afternoon retrieving all of this and writing to people. And I got back the nicest letters. One was a friend of my mother's who, you know, I mean, my mother's been dead for quite a while now, but used to have lunch with her at the country club and she can't read now, but she, you know, really wants the store to succeed. And, you know, so she sent a check and one was from one of our best customers who said, she, we've been her local bookstore forever, even though she doesn't live here and she just, you know, oh, was. Nice. And, you know, it was so nice reading all of these very kind notes. Well, we've, got, we've got great conversation going on on Facebook between Stefania and, and uh, a really nice person on Australia. So this is really kind of cool. You're just bringing the world together, Mark. Okay, wow. so morning in Australia. I know how to do this. I'm an expert <laughs> at this. We are 15 hours and the next day from Australia because uh -huh. I just did a double Australian event. So for this person's drinking coffee and Stefania, mm -hmm. we are either nine or 10 hours. So at like three in the eight o'clock right? here, it's like three in the morning. So I conclude she's a night owl. And Definitely then we have another customer in Romania who often uh -huh. appears. Yeah. Um, so it's amazing to me how you know that is, how this works. That is super cool. Good anyway, out. enjoy your conversation, everybody, <laughs> and thank uh, you both. I mean, thank all of you, so both the live audience and the virtual audience, for uh -huh. coming tonight. It's a very nice thing for Mark to have a chance to Definitely. celebrate his first hardcover book. Definitely. Thank yep, you. Yep. At thank the you start of a me. series, we've been together all the way through, haven't we? Yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. We have, right? So, a decade. Anyway, what a treat. So, um, good night. Thank you for joining us. And if you, yep, round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And if, if any of you have a book you'd like to get signed or you didn't, um, you can. And um, I have a free.